My name is Ibrahim Chow. Uh, I work with UNEP. I'm the Deputy Executive Director of UNEP. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here today and um, would like to welcome all of you to this session. It's a beautiful uh, environment. It reminds you of many things, I'm sure, uh, these kind of rooms and, uh, and environments. And I hope um, it will remind you of also proactiveness and uh, interaction with uh, whoever has the floor. Um, welcome to the Forum on Landscapes in a Green Economy. Um, the transition to a green economy is gaining momentum in many countries, in many companies, and in many communities. As we heard this morning from uh, the opening ceremony and subsequent uh, panel discussions, adopting the landscapes approach, by the way, landscapes has 30 other names and acronyms, but let's just use that um, Eight, 30. More than 80. More than 80 now, so <laughs> keep growing. <And> keep growing. <laughs> uh, but for the sake of uh, the discussion today, let's just use the, uh, the word landscapes. So the landscapes approach, adopting this approach is critically important uh, if we are to achieve sustainable development. We need a new economic paradigm that focuses on natural capital, on ecosystem services, on resource efficiency, and social equity. Red Plus reduced emission from deforestation and forest degradation in developing countries has been considered as the low-hanging fruit for climate change mitigation and adaptation. Reducing deforestation and forest degradation not only contribute to combating climate change, but also contributes to biodiversity conservation. Red Plus implies improved governance of forested landscapes. This forum is dealing with the three complex issues that are relatively new to many people, namely landscapes approach, Red Plus, and green economy. We need to unpack these issues or even demystify them for many of us. More importantly, we need to make these work seamlessly to get together for the benefits of current and future generations. With us today, we have a truly distinguished panel. A mix of scientists, community level actions, actors, community level actors, government representatives, private sector, and international civil servants. We also have you as, panel, as, as uh, audience and as participants, and I hope also as respondents. As we wish to have a vibrant and lively discussion, we are just too little to have a silent room. I, I would like to have a very interactive discussion with you. We have initially two and a half hours, we can say maybe now two hours, uh, but that's a lot of time for this forum. I uh, also would like to inform you that uh, the discussions are being video recorded for further viewing by thousands of interested participants from around the world. With some luck, we may have some questions from Twitter or Facebook. Uh, our teams are collecting some information, even though it is not uh, streamed live, but many people know about this event, and hopefully we will be having some uh, uh, interventions. Let me now introduce uh, the team that is at the table here. We'll first have a keynote speaker, uh, Mr. Mario Bucucci. Can you raise your hand, please? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and say, um, Marco is the head of the UN Red Program Secretariat. He's based in Geneva. The UN Red, Secret the UN Red Program, as you know, is uh, co supported by UNDP, FAO, and UN. Mario has been acting as head of the UN Red Program since January of this year. He has more than 20 years of experience in many organizations, including the World Bank and UNEP. 
Mario will be uh, introducing the discussion for around 10 minutes, uh, maybe 11, if he's not here. <laughs> uh, and we would like to give now, the, after that, we'd like to give the chance to another imminent personalities that are around the table here to be respondents. Uh, and we also have someone in the room, whom I will introduce later on, who is spying on us and will be summarizing the discussion at the end of the discussion. Mario, let me give you the floor first, and then I will introduce the respondents as they take the floor, as I introduce them, and I will introduce the later stage, whoever is taking note in a very serious manner, maybe the spy on us. But um, the intention is to have a person who will be reporting for us and is known for being extremely efficient in providing summary discussions at the end of, of the discussion. Mario, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Ibrahim, and uh, good afternoon to uh, everybody. In the spirit of having a, an interaction, uh, interactive discussion, I'm going to you know, start to warm you up with a few questions. Um, as we proceed, you'll get possibly more. So the first question is, how, it's an easy one, I hope. How many of you were at the plenary this morning? You can just please raise your hands if you were at the plenary. But a good group. I was at the plenary too, and um, you know I was inspired, very impressed by all the speakers, and in particular by uh, Rachel Kite. Rachel Kite is the vice president of the World Bank for Sustainable Development, and she made a very, very passionate uh, uh, presentation and discussion on how you know a landscape approach can really deliver on a triple win can deliver on food security, it can deliver on economic growth, and it can deliver on climate change mitigation. And she, you know, she spoke for, you know, twice as much as the time I have been given. <laughs> she spoke for about 20 minutes, and during these 20 minutes, she repeatedly kept asking the question, if you know, a landscape approach can deliver a triple bottom uh, line, if we already know all what we know in terms of what it takes to deliver. And we have done so many tests and, and we have tried it out uh, at the field level in so many places. Why don't we see it scaled up? Why don't we see it taking up at a greater space? And she concluded uh, with, with this question. So why is, why is it that we don't see a landscape approach being replicated across the planet at a much greater speed? So here comes the second question to you. How many of you thought, or think, if you were not uh, at this plenary uh, session this morning, how many of you do you think that, yes, that is the question, that is the question that is in front of us. If you believe that was the right question, just raise your hand. <laughs> okay, <laughs> either shy people or... <laughs> uh, I personally thought, you know, that that was absolutely the right question. So... Whether you thought of it as being the right question or not, here comes another question to you. This one you have to answer. <laughs> How many of you think that, you know, gosh, I wish we had an answer to that question? <laughs> okay. <laughs> and how many of you actually think, yes, you know, I have the answer to the question. I wish she asked me. How many of you think that you have the question? Come on, <laughs> nobody thinks so. Just modified a little bit. <laughs> At least a little. Okay, so um, what we're going to do with uh, this session, uh, you know, it's really going to give us an opportunity for those who think uh, you had the question to interrogate, to corroborate it, to test it out, to share it with the rest of the room. And for those who didn't think you had uh, the question or the whole question, to really you know, start seeing light at the end of the tunnel. So for the next 10 minutes, <laughs> this was, or the next uh, 8 minutes, uh, I'm going to turn myself into a carpenter. And yes, this is how uh, Italian carpenters uh, like to dress, you know, we're a very <laughs> elegant uh, society. And uh, I'm going to do, uh, what I, I want to do, I want to put a few nails down, metaphorically, on the wall, where we can hang 
our answers to Rachel Kipe's uh, question, and we can start weaving, weaving a storyline that connects, connects the um, <coughs> landscape approach with the green economy uh, with red. And I forgot my watch. <laughs> Sorry, somebody. Yeah. And please. I will give you my. Yes. Um, so the first nail down is about something you've heard so many times. A business as usual approach is not an option. Again, today, yesterday, uh, there's been so many reports that say that the development pathway, the development paradigm that we have put in place and that uh, we have used for the last so many years is no longer going to be able to deliver on what needs to be delivered, keeping in mind that we're going to have 9 billion people on this planet in a few decades uh, from now. Uh, with changing diets, with increasing demand for food, uh, that we're going to have uh, climate change that is increasingly going to constrain the type of productivity that we uh, can have. So a business-as-usual approach is you know, off the table. We need to think of paradigm shift, as Ibrahim had mentioned, of a way in which we can uh, still develop as economies we can still grow, but we can do it in a way that delivers also socially and environmentally desirable uh, outcomes. And that's where the green economy uh, paradigm com comes in. This is my second need. So the first one was business as usual, not an option. The second one is on, on a green economy. Basically, in the simple terms, what the green economy uh, planet uh, is about is that, um, you know, uh, a triple bottom line is possible. You can develop your economies, you can grow, you can meet all of your macroeconomic targets, and at the same time, you can produce socially desirable outcomes, you can produce environmentally desirable outcomes. And UNEP has been working on this you know, for the last two years intensively, and is amassed uh, you know, a huge literature, literature that shows where this has been tested, where this has been uh, uh, debated and to say that yes, it is possible. Um, so, um, a, a, a green economy uh, and the green economy work that has been done so far allows us to understand that transforming uh, economies is possible, that there is not the necessity to do tra trade offs between uh, development and sustainability, that the two things can happen together. This is where the landscape approach uh, comes in. And again, you have heard so much about what a landscape approach is uh, in the last two days. And what I really want to point out here is that the take-home message for me is that, you know, for a country, for a society that wants to embark on this type of, of transformation to reorient its economic development pathway in a way that it does not deplete um, the natural resources, the natural capital, but builds on the natural capital in order to produce uh, the dividends that society needs, you need, we need to really transform the way that we manage our lands, that we manage our landscape. That landscapes are such a fundamental component, especially in developing countries, or middle, in, middle income countries also, are such an important component of the uh, economic growth uh, texture, that that's a place where we need to intervene. And that we have to step out of the uh, traditional sectoral approach where we just, just oppose uh, outcomes on a sector by sector. And here, just two quick uh, data points. The first one is a study from FAO of, um, I think now two years ago, basically has projected that in a business as usual approach with a growing population, if we are to feed uh, 9 billion people in 20 years from now, even after we discounted some type of uh, food waste, um, we will st may still need some 150 million hectares of land to be put into production. And you know, the business as usual approach is to get the land uh, out of the forest. On the other hand, we're also saying that in order to allow this planet to you know, remain on a trajectory for a less than two degree um, uh, temperature increase, we need to reduce deforestation. And, uh, and in order to do that, we actually are going to lock out even more land from being available for, um, for agriculture. 
So unless we think of a landscape approach where we find ways to you know, produce the desired outcome uh, at a systemic level, we're not going to succeed. And this is where the, the red and uh, the red plus um, idea, instrument, uh, comes in. And let me start by saying that red plus is not about forestry. Yes, it is about uh, reducing deforestation, and by reducing deforestation, reducing um, you know, uh, um, carbon emissions, and therefore contributing to climate change mitigation. But in the, in the first place, Red Plus is about addressing the drivers of deforestation, and the driver of deforestation are mostly, uh, prominently, outside the forest sector. So uh, what Red can do now is to play as a catalyst for the type of landscape transformation which in turn will deliver the green economy transformation. Uh, and can do that because RED has been debated now for quite many years. As a result of that, there is a critical mass of support, a critical mass of champions out there, already a critical mass of political will to use this instrument and a critical mass of uh, funding uh, to bring uh, that about. So RED could lead by example. It could start illustrating that the type of transformation that we want to see in the economies and in the landscape are possible. Are possible in a number of significant jurisdictions where delivery at scale uh, can take place. Um, the final fifth uh, nail on the wall is about you know what will deliver this uh, in in the short what will deliver this change in, in, in the time the short time frame that we have and there's of course many things that could be considered as entry point but for the purpose of this discussion I would like to propose that we consider the uh, sequencing of public sector investment and private sector investments public sector investments needs to come first to lower the barrier at entry for the private sector to redirect uh, its uh, investment in a, in a sustainable direction. And the public sector investment is about bringing stakeholders participation, creating a demand and an oversight by civil society, putting in place the governance arrangement, the rule of law, uh, addressing the tenure issue, all things that the private sector is not able to tackle uh, frontally, but if the public sector uh, can do that, then the private sector should be ready to step in and invest you know, the level of trillions uh, that we have been talking about. So just finally to say that none of, let's not fool ourselves, this is not simple, this is super complex. Um, you know, I was looking for a quote from a, a, an eminent a, a, a Polish person, as so I was thinking of Chopin or Copernicus, I didn't have the time to find anything, so I'll revert to somebody who was born in the neighborhood, <laughs> that's Einstein. Uh, he once said, uh, I mean in the neighborhood, in another country of course, uh, he once said, I can make it simpler, but I cannot make it simple. And I think this is the same story uh, for us here. It's not simple, but if we can make it simpler, then I think we have a, a tipping point ahead of us and the landscape transformation, the transformation, the type of transformation that the green economy is proposing it can indeed take place. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mario. Um, I knew you were a good leader. I knew you were... You were Excellent expert, but today I am discovering that you are a carpenter. <laughs> a very good one. Um, we have uh, four respondents, and I'll start with you, Sarah. Okay. Um, Sarah Sher is the president of Eco Agriculture Partners. Um, she is also, I think, the founder of uh, Eco Agriculture Partners a non-profit that works with agriculture communities around the world to develop eco-agriculture landscapes, she will explain what it means, that enhance rural livelihoods, have sustainable and productive agriculture systems, and conserve or enhance biodiversity and ecosystem services. Sarah, is it possible to have that combination of agriculture, feeding the people, conserving biodiversity, and caring about the planet. Do you agree with what Mario was saying, his five points? Uh, Ibrahim 
Good, morning, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I definitely do believe that it is possible, and I believe that um, not only because it's an ideal for us to, to aspire to, but because we've been spending the last number of years looking at the cases of groups and, that have been working in landscapes to make these kinds of transformations. So I, we actually have a very large number of examples to learn from. Um, we've just completed an, an inventory of integrated landscape initiatives in Latin America and in Africa, and there was, a, there was 104 in one and 87 in the other one, and that was just the ones that responded to our inquiries. There were many more that we identified but were not able to document, and that inventory process is going on around the world. Um, we've also looked in depth at a number of these initiatives, and um, there are very, very many models. Um, there often is an entry point with a particular interest in water or biodiversity or food productivity or, or land restoration. But we definitely have a number. I would say that the data is not really high quality in terms of the impacts. We have quite limited documentation, in part because people don't have the uh, tools yet to do the kind of integrated monitoring that we, that we need. But there's no question in my mind that this is an opportunity. And it's driven uh, not because people get bored one day and say, I think I would like to do a landscape approach. Um, no one does that because it is a little bit more difficult. It requires people to move beyond their comfort zone in terms of the people they normally associate and the technical expertise that they have themselves. So it's a little bit psychologically difficult sometimes for people to move forward. So people do this typically when there really is a demand a demand for it. And um, we, we think of landscapes as these socio-ecological mosaics, but the integrated landscape management is the effort by stakeholders in the landscape to, to cooperate t together. So I would say that um, we, we definitely have that, that opportunity, and it's starting to happen at much larger scale. Um, at the session yesterday, um, Mar Margot Hill was, was presenting a case of a very large landscape in um, the Brazilian rainforest of the Atlantic Forest, where hundreds of thousands of hectares, um, there are, are a very large number of organizations that have cooperated in an, in an organization called PACT to um, basically uh, develop a, a collaborative strategy for conserving forest, reforesting, increasing forest businesses, increasing agricultural productivity in markets. Um, through a wide number of financing mechanisms and a wide number of, um, of, of, of programs um, on the ground from farmers on, on up. Um, I can speak about some other examples, but I think my, should I stop or can I give another, I need to give one more. Okay, um, one, one of the, th we've, we've been working at this individual landscape scale primarily at Eco Agriculture Partners, but we had the opportunity two years ago uh, to collaborate with the, um, something called the SAGCOT Center, the Southern Agricultural Growth Corridor of Tanzania, um, which had been working in 2009 to develop a blueprint for a very large scale investment program. In fact, it's somewhere between two and three billion dollars of public and private funding that were intended to transform southern Tanzania to become actually a, one of the bread baskets of, of Africa, particularly around rice and sugar. Um, but also they were going to rebuild and reinforce infrastructure, promote agro-industrial development. I mean, really a very, a very um, uh, ambitious kind of a program, and it represents some of these growth corridors that are actually being replicated in, in many different parts of the world. But that first blueprint was absolutely 1960s agro-industrial development, I think, really. It was very much seed fertilizer, irrigation, high energy, conventional energy use, um, uh, a narrow range of specific export commodity crops and local crops. And it, it was very interesting and certainly all things that needed to be done, but it wasn't a green economy strategy. And I think the stakeholders involved in that took a look at what they were doing, stepped back a little bit and said, my goodness, we are promoting an agro-industrial growth of enormous proportions in an area that has 
major Ramsar wetlands protection areas, some of the most important red initiatives uh, in, from Tanzania, um, an area where eco wildlife tourism is the second most important source of income for the country. So all of a sudden they're saying, wait a minute, how are we going to do this agricultural development initiative without taking into account all of these other, uh, other sectors? And so they asked us to collaborate with them in developing an agricultural green growth strategy. Well, we had never worked at the level of these large corridors before. Um, but we thought, what happens if you think about agro-industrial development with the lens of a landscape approach, with, a, with landscape thinking? How does it look different? I'm sure from Indonesia we have a, some good examples to describe about that and other. But one of the th let me just tell you very briefly, um, before my time is up here, what the key things that came out of that assessment were, and, and our methodology was primarily consultation with individuals and companies and, and farmers organizations within Tanzania to talk about what they thought they could already do. It wasn't pie in the sky thinking, it was what is already existing in southern Tanzania that we could build in. And there were basically four key areas of action. One of them was a whole series of green, quote unquote, green agricultural investments that could take place. A lot of experience with conservation agriculture that was in the process of expanding. Good for climate, much higher levels of productivity. By the way, I didn't mention this is one of the poorest areas of Tanzania. Very low crop yields, very high levels of malnutrition, largely dominated by smallholders. So anyway, conservation agriculture, system of rice intensification, very much requiring very much less water than conventional rice production was a whole range of agroforestry systems, a whole range of drought tolerant crop varieties that were ready to be that were already being introduced. These could all be scaled up. Another area, sustainable farm inputs. Looking at precision agriculture, there was a number of companies that have already started to experiment with precision agriculture. Um, looking at bio inputs and the potential for developing new businesses with bio inputs, looking at solar and biogas as sort alternative sources of energy, and then a whole range of forest and eco enterprises, including payments for ecosystem services, which are already being done within southern Tanzania. The, and then reading the value chain, opportunities already eco certification programs being set up or already in place in Tanzania that could be dramatically expanded, and green methods for, in, for constructing infrastructure. But the second really important thing that I think has been so much less looked at was what we call creating fertile ground for these things because they're just not going to happen. They needed, I think as Mario was saying, need much better government arrangements for land and water allocation. Much better action for mobilizing local organizations, farmers organizations, so they can be part of the planning process and so they can access funding. Um, and they, there really is no significant extension system in Tanzania that could handle these green technologies. They just don't know about the green technologies. And finally, there really was no mechanism for the kind of collaborative landscape level planning um, that was really needed to, to, to help private actors and private investors uh, to move there. The, the third, and that's where I'll stop, the third um, element that came out that was quite important was the finance. How do you mobilize financing in this? And there were two strategies. One of them, there is actually a lot of money going into the area. And a lot of it could be defining the criteria for eligibility, for access to public and semi-public money, or even from the private money, screening <coughs> private money to make sure that new agricultural investments not only comply with the voluntary guidelines, but also comply with the vision for agricultural green growth that they have in southern Tanzania. And then there's a number of new sources of, agri of, of finance for ag green growth, some of which are being set up by the program, some of it from sustainable land management, some of it from climate change, conservation finance, impact investors. A lot of these groups are interested in southern Tanzania, but there was no framework within which when they came to Tanzania, someone could say, this is, this is the way we would like to see you invest. Very much uh, for this very concrete uh, mm -hmm. example of actually a large scale mm -hmm. investment uh, where public and private funding were mobilized. That connects very well to my next uh, respondent, uh, which is Martin Paulson, um, who is from Moringa Investments. Uh, Martin is a partner uh, at Moringa Partnership. Um, 
he uh, previously he worked for the African Development Bank, for the European Investment Bank. Uh, he uh, was uh, he he had worked for many other agencies uh, in Africa, essentially in Cote d'Ivoire, in Swaziland, in many other uh, places. I asked him this morning, Martin, why did you call your company Moringa? Uh, maybe we should start with that and then uh, challenge a little bit Maria or, or, or Sarah. Martin. Thank you very much um, for that, uh, that uh, very nice introduction. Um, I, I may, I may um, answer or, or just respond a bit to the, 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 the keynote speech uh, and answer at the same time your question about why, uh, why Moringa next, and, or maybe may, may, come, may come to that at the end. Um, but I, um, uh, there was a couple of very interesting uh, uh, aspects in the introduction, and one of, one of the things you mentioned, Mario, was the... Uh, the, the importance of addressing drivers of deforestation. And the genesis of Moringa was, uh, was originally in, in thinking about how to, um, if you like, support the Red Plus initiative uh, and how could a fund be constituted which would be principally uh, preoccupied with, uh, with, uh, with, with that, um, that mechanism. Um, and then I think as people sat down and thought more about it, uh, the question of landscapes, uh, the question of smallholders, the question of agriculture, the question of food, all of those things uh, were in the background and we, we didn't find a way to, if you like, convincingly merge that or, or, or locate that inside a principally red driven and uh, uh, forestry oriented strategy. So that was where the idea of agroforestry was, uh, was, was born because we felt that that uh, more neatly dealt with the broader range of things that we were looking to encompass in, in an, an essentially sustainability oriented uh, investment fund structure. Um, so that, the genesis of, of Moringa was exactly in that, uh, in that discussion. Uh, one, of the point, one of the questions you, you put to us, Mario, as well, was an interesting one, uh, uh, and I didn't raise my hand for good reasons, but you asked us who has the answer to uh, the, the very many questions that, were, that, that, are, that are implicit in this discussion. And I, we, we for sure don't have the answer, but we, we may have a little piece of the answer. Uh, our, our lives as investors are generally rather focused on very specific investment opportunities. So, uh, and over time, uh, over the next five years, if all goes well, we'll invest in between 10 and 15 projects across a large uh, geographical area, Sub-Saharan Africa and Latin America. Uh, so whichever way we look at it, our intervention, our impact in the direct sense is very pinpoint in that huge area. Um, but we are hopeful that by uh, showing success at investing in agroforestry projects in those in that area, that the individual case studies of those uh, those businesses that we back will be quite powerful in terms of uh, of mobilising additional private sector capital, of of showing the public sector that uh, as private sector actors we're able to uh, invest in a way which is coherent with public sector objectives as well. So that's a, a key question. I think we have a small part of the answer. We need help from. Uh, the other components in that very complex system to really make it work, but I think that uh, um, in answer to your uh, another point you uh, you asked was uh, how to deal with this question of sequencing public sector versus private sector. I suppose our, our feeling is that uh, the public sector has has created a sufficiently um, compelling context, if you like, for us to be able to persuade our investors, who by the way are public investors and private investors. We've raised a fund of 50 million euros today, uh, including public sector investors and private sector investors. We've gone far enough down the road, I think, to be able to convince those investors that the context in which we're working is sufficiently um, coherent and solid to start. That doesn't mean that we have everything we need. So for example, we're also raising a small, what we call our technical assistance facility uh, fund, which is a much smaller fund, 5 million euros which will uh, be grant financed as opposed to a pure investment fund and which we will be able to use to compensate for, for some of the deficiencies that we, we, we face in, in, the, in the, uh, some of the uh, quite frontier market countries in which we, in which we work. Um, so perhaps then just to wrap up with a, a response to your question, uh, why, why, why the step uh, back into Moringa from, from the African Development Bank and the IB? Well, in a sense, it's a personal question uh, and I think for me, it's, uh, it's a, a long-held, I suppose, belief that um, the private sector has uh, a, quite a powerful role to play in development of many of the countries in which we work. In Moringa, I think uh, I see a vehicle which is able to uh, deliver the triple bottom line 
uh, returns and impact that, uh, that is required to do that. Uh, so from a personal perspective, it's quite a compelling uh, vehicle to be involved in. That's, uh, that would be the short answer to the question. But Moringa is a plant. Moringa is a moringa is a is a plant indeed, and, and uh, um, I will uh, I face this question or observation often. Many many other comments about moringa because it's a well known uh, well known plant. We chose moringa not because we plan to create projects of thousands of hectares of moringa, uh, just in case there's anybody who's hoping that I can invest in their moringa project. Um, but we did it because of the very we found it emblematic of sustainability, if you like, the way that Moringa can be used for many different purposes, from food to medicine to fuel, etc. And so it was an emblem that we liked. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Martin, and uh, also um, you know, bringing that deep experience from uh, many parts of the world, including from Africa. We will remain in Africa. Uh, our next speaker is coming from Kenya. <coughs> Uh, Agnes Lena, um, I found out last night in a casual discussion that Agnes and I have many things in common. Uh, even though I'm originally from the western part of Africa, it turns out that actually we are all coming from the same origin in that uh, place which is now uh, called either Egypt or Sudan. But that's the origin of most of Africans and it turns out that we are coming from the same community and believe you me, we still have the same taboos. <laughs> um, it's, it's, it's quite interesting. We will continue that and we will certainly publish a book about it. <laughs> Agnes is the executive director of a small organization called ICC, Ilaramatak Ila Community Concerns. She'll correct me because I'm sure I massacred the name. Um, a group that promotes the human rights of pastoralist communities in northern and southern Kenya, with a special emphasis on women and girls. Agnes is an indigenous woman from Kenya, as I said, with links to the Maasai, the Samburu, the Turkana, the Somali, the Borana, and the Rendele peoples. Uh, you may not know all of these tribes, but I, it was important for me to list them because they are quite significant and quite diverse at the same time, which shows that actually uh, Agnes has a very large network uh, in her country. Agnes, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, I just want to emphasize the fact that we have been hearing about plants, plantations, agriculture, moringa plant, and I want to take you a little bit away from that. It's still a mode of farming, but it's pastoralism. In fact, the word ilaramatak means pastoralist or herders or caregivers, if you may. I just want to say that um, for, we're talking about the red, we're talking about green economy, we're talking about all these technologies and terminologies. And among pastoralists, those terminologies are not yet there. But yet, pastoralists are the best people to take care and to, to, to conserve what we call rangelands or landscapes, if you may. Actually, in most African countries, 80% of the land is arid and semi-arid. Definitely, you cannot plant anything there. Not moringa, not tea, nothing. But it is the best for pastoralism. And for a very long time, the pastoralists are actually used to the fact that they expect erratic rainfall and they expect drought. So they have always been completely aware and waiting how to, to go about it. They actually, for a very long time, without uh, any intervention, outside intervention, have been able to mitigate and adapt to these climate change shocks that are affecting them. This is because we have our own traditional knowledge and we have Council of Elders. For instance, if we know that then we have our own names, we have our own way of, of, of knowing the next thing we are not going to have rain. We have a way of looking at the trees. Somehow there is a, a certain tree you look at and it's starting to become green. It's having green leaves when it's actually very, very dry. Then the next thing you hear the elders telling us, we are about to get rain. So before it rains, we all have to go to the mountain, for instance. So we migrate to other places and then leave this other, the, 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 the place that we have migrated from to recuperate. 
And this is, as, as Ibrahim was talking about, we, we depend on our own traditional knowledge and it's a taboo. You cannot listen to the elders and they say that you have to move. Definitely your, 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 your livestock is going to be struck either by a disease or, or maybe the, the raiders or something like that. But you have to listen and move as a community. We've definitely had challenges as a pastoralist communities because of the way the land is being seen to be idle. You know, there is this notion that this is plenty of land and it's idle land, so we have to give it up for the most favored, maybe farming or even for, 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 wild, for national parks, because definitely we all need this the much needed uh, dollar. And then we, definitely we have had a lot of reduction of our land because of that. But the fact remains that we are the ones who have actually known how to manage our own lands using our own traditional knowledge. I just want to say that um, red must ensure equitable sharing of benefits, diversified, diversified um, livelihoods, and protection of indigenous knowledge. There is need to have the indigenous knowledge and the technology that we have these days. Put the two of them together and come up with something. And not just to ignore the traditional knowledge and say this is outdated and then come up with all these um, sophisticated words and then ignore the communities that have been living there with the animals, you know, the wild animals, and have been living there with these uh, um, forests for such a long time. And we also have a way of knowing which animals actually, um, because we keep animals, uh, not, not um, farming, as, uh, agricultural farming, as I said earlier. So our, most of our animals are grazers. We have only one species, which is uh, a browser, which is the camel. So definitely, in terms of taking care of the environment, pastoralists, pastoralism is one of the best uh, ways of doing that. And we have realized that we are losing a lot of that tradition, and we are losing a lot of that knowledge. What we need now is to document that traditional knowledge, those traditional knowledge systems, and then combine them with whatever else that comes up. And also, of course, take back the information that we're getting here back to the communities so that they too are aware and they know what's going on. There is a way in which they, they can also be involved right from the, the, the beginning up to the very end. And um, there is need for consultation and participation with indigenous peoples in criti uh, in, um, for, for success of red programs at all levels, at the level of the design of it, the strategies, and the benefit sharing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Agnes. Uh, and thank you for caring for pastoralists. Uh, I thought pastoralism is the best way of managing lands in arid lands. Indeed, when we talk about landscapes, most of the time we think about agriculture and not much about other types of uh, land use and land use planning. And indeed, when we uh, have land tenure systems, we, they are mostly designed for farming and agriculture, not much for uh, pastoralists and pastoral communities in most part of the world, in uh, uh, marginal uh, communities. They are not mainstreamed into development. Let's move on from, uh, let's actually fly from Africa and land in a country that has how many thousand islands? 13,000. 13, 13,000 islands. Uh, that's, there's only one country in the world. Indonesia. Um, Paheru Prasetyo is deputy head of President's Delivery Unit for Development, Monitoring and Oversight, UPK4. Forget about the long name. This unit in the office of the President of Indonesia is the one you need to go to if you need a decision to be made, or is the one that is doing planning and doing monitoring and oversight on behalf of the president for what the government is to deliver on. Baheru is uh, the deputy head of planning and international relations in that unit. Before that, he was the director of international, for international relations of the executing agency that rebuilt Aceh mm -hmm. after the tsunami. What a monumental task. A, a huge task that 
has recently been assigned to the unit that uh, Paheru uh, and Parkuntoro are managing in the Red Plus in Indonesia. I used to, well, I'm still doing that, but let me repeat. Uh, Red Plus in the world will be, will be with or without Indonesia. Because I think this is one of the countries where we have now, after um, uh, another country, but Indonesia is the country where most of the challenges are, but also most of the hopes are. So the hope is in your hands, sir. <laughs> Thank you, Ibrahim, my friend. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. From here, I can see dark outside, okay? And this is only four o'clock. I feel so inadequate, at the same time, I feel so lucky. I feel so inadequate because I think the language has moved very far from the original meaning of the terms, landscape. But I'm also very lucky because of that landscape word. Because when I look into Wikipedia or Oxford Dictionary, what I found, landscape is wider than deeper. Wider than deep. This is landscape. This is portrait, right? <laughs> <laughs> and I think somehow why I think it's quite uh, lucky that I have that, meaning when I look into that, is that because from my perspective, being in the president's unit, things are wide but not deep. So when you're talking about listening to the deep story of the story of the depth, I think that is very much encouraging. Let me say, let me tell you why I see wide and not deep. And let's see whether that is the definition of landscape later on. The way that I see it, when I got into this responsibility of doing red, the first thing that we are trying to do is to be able to measure the emission reduction from deforestation wall to wall in Indonesia, three time zones. <laughs> from the west to the east, 13,000 islands, and we need to be able to measure the reduction of emission from deforestation in those 13,000 islands. How can I go deep? I have to go wide. My landscape is three time zones. So having said that, we say that can we do that on a three time zone as a landscape, work on something that is so seriously being discussed about what landscape approach is? I don't think so. So we zoom in into Kalimantan Tengah we zoom in into a district, we zoom in into a village, and then we say that the best way to do landscape is when it is small. Because when you are trying to make it big, then I think the racial waste question becomes very serious. Why is it not scaled up? Because when you scaled up, is that you are going from the atmosphere to stratosphere. Because the way that you want to see your landscape, you can see it from crowd level, you go to a tower, you go to a 50-story building, you go to a plane, the plane, you go to a satellite, right? That is one issue that I feel is actually facing us. And the atmosphere is different than your stratosphere, it's different than the ionosphere. You go up, you cannot breathe. That is the difficulties of scaling up of the landscape approach. Now, that was my theory. And I thought I was already very wide. I thought I was already very thin. I thought I already be very landscape approach in paper. And then the president gave us another job because he was asked to be the co-chair of the high level panel for post-2015 development agenda. And so my challenge changed from being wall to wall into down to down because I have to deal with the whole planet. We have to deal with the 50,000 consultation with indigenous people, with CSO, with academics, with politicians, with whatever you can say that is having a concern about the life of this planet. And we have to do a landscape that is worldwide. So we went up with the satellite. 
But the problem is, even if you go as far as you can, you can only see half of the earth. <laughs> see, when you're talking about landscape approach, you're talking about red, you're talking about the things that is connected to that and green economy at the same time, you have that basic challenge of perspective. I agree totally, I understand totally that it's not talking about the business as usual, like Mario mentioned, is considered to be sectoral approach. But sectoral approach is not the only approach that needs to be changed. Right? Sectoral approach is one. Are we still working on our scientific discipline or are we going cross-discipline? That's not sectoral, that's discipline. We need to go also cross-discipline. Now, let me put that aside a bit, if I still have time, if Ibrahim gives yeah, me more time, okay? And that is about red plus. Okay, when we do red plus, when we say that, all right, there's reduction of emission, blah, 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 and then we look into a lower part, how can we do this? If our regulation is not making it possible to do that, if our institution doesn't have the capacity to do that, if our people is still having the paradigm, if I don't eat now, I will not support. And because of that, some of my friends, the masyarakat adat or your indigenous people, is supporting the move for the palm oil company to enter their forest because they need the money. Because they, their life, life, livelihood from the forest is not enough. So they want more because they want motorcycle, they want television, they want mobile phone. I mean, that is a challenge that is real. So you have to see that in a way that is perhaps definitely not business as usual. But then when you're doing that and you get into the core of the issue, and you can look into that, what is then green economy? And you want to do green economy in that sense. Green economy as defined by UNEP, all right, is saying it's an economy that is improving the well-being, the human well-being, and social equity at the same time, not sequential at the same time, minimizing the environmental risk as well as ecological scarcity. That is big words, all right? You're trying to do the whole green economy and what is economy in the first place? That is the approach, right? Economy is actually the art of managing our household. Or economos, right? So if that means that you're talking about a management of affairs in your country, in your jurisdiction, in your environment, that is talking about improving human well-being, social equity, blah, 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 how does it connect in a landscape approach? How does it connect with red? I mean, that is the challenge. We can go deeper and say that, all right, if we look into this part, this is the solution. If we look into this part, this is the solution. Even if we are talking about cross-sectoral, even if we have gone far from that location into the issue of interdisciplinary, I got another question. And that question is, when I'm already defining my landscape, when I'm already managing that with the principle of green economy, when I am already doing that in a way that is balancing the use of land, such that I can provide continuous food, I can provide continuous water, I can provide continuous energy, and at the same time, doing what the people of the world needs to do from the beginning of time, which is conserving the forest, but was not done, so we are trying to do that, play and catch up on that. If that is already done, so we are done. Landscape done, red plus done, okay? Green economy done. And suddenly there is an office out there in Geneva or somewhere. This is called WTO. <laughs> and there is another office in New York that is calling about, all right, let's do the funds flow moving. If you are having some problem with your money, I will speculate on that and your country is dead, I don't care. That is the economic system of the world. We need to look into landscape, including that. The flow of funds, the flow of goods, the flow of people, as well as the flow of ideas. 
I am indeed very inadequate to talk about landscape. I'm just seeing it from a different perspective because the one that the first time that I know about what is landscape is it is wider than deeper. And we need to go deep. All right, so if we go deep there and then try to answer the question of Mario earlier, we have to do with public funding and public funding will draw private plant funding, right? I remember old time when I was still a student sitting in this kind of, uh, and I have my experience, first experience working outside my projects, and I learned what is called CPM. I think if you are studying engineering, you know that, critical path method. One issue done after another, sequential approach, right? And then I talked to that with some builder. Look, you have to do CPM, because if you don't do CPM, you're not going to be very efficient in your process. All right, that's good. Wow, you're a young chap, very smart. Okay. <laughs> now, can you tell me if I have to build a foundation for a wall that is 100 meters, do I have to wait until the foundation is done and then build the wall on top? Huh? But you know, sir, he said, if, I, if you do that, then the foundation is already hard and you cannot build the wall properly on top of that. So what did you do, I said? I built 10 meters, I built the wall. I built 10 meters, I built the wall. I built 10 meters, I, built, I built the wall. And that is called the project evaluation and review techniques approach whereby it is not going to be sequential. I don't believe that public funding needs to come everything first and only after that the private funding will come. I think we have to do that part by part. And that can be on a landscape approach, on a jurisdictional approach. You correct, you prepare the foundation in one district, public funding for that, small one, and then the private fund can come to that. The next district, and then the private fund comes to that again. And if you do that in the whole world, then what will you see in the map is that actually public funding and private funding working hand, to hand, hand in hand, because that is the rule of how to make it happen. So sorry again, I'm very thin. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paiho, uh, for, uh, for this uh, intervention. Sorry to walk. Um, I meant to actually go deeper into the questions now, but what I would do instead is to give you the floor for your interventions, your questions, uh, your queries, if you want to probe, if you want to disagree, uh, if you want to ask a question. Uh, do you have a mic? Um, so please grab a mic, introduce yourself for not too long, but please spell your name clearly so that we know who is speaking and which organization. And if you have a specific question to a particular person, please orient your question. If not, I will handle it. Okay, great. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Charles McNeil. I'm with UNDP, and I've uh, valued this discussion. I, I like the five-point framework that Dr. Bocucci laid out, and I, and I do appreciate the downsides of the sectoral approach, focusing on forests here and agriculture here and water here. But I wonder, and this is really a question for Pak Heru, um, and then I have another question for, for somebody else, but I wonder if governments really can handle that concept of landscapes. When you have ministries of forests and you have ministries of agriculture, can they get their heads around that concept? You're in a unique position having overall responsibility, so you might be one of the only people in any government in the world who could, but I, I wonder if that concept of landscapes will take hold in governments given the sort of political realities there. Um, and I also have a question from Martin. Um, Mario talked about how public financing and private financing need to be phased with public coming first. Um, civil society and indigenous peoples are sometimes very concerned that the private sector will be the beneficiary, will be the recipient of a lot of the initial government investment. And, and, and that's a, a real concern. I wanted to know from the, your perspective of the private sector, do you need that funding from government or do you just need a, a level playing field? Do you need a regulatory environment of rules and laws that allow you to have a clear 
game to play. And so progressive and proactive efforts won't be penalized or you won't suffer from that. So I just sort of wondered, from your perspective, how you would address the concern by civil society that the private sector might, might be the beneficiary rather than perhaps civil society. So I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let us take more questions, uh, which gives the time, uh, a little bit of time for our panelists to think about your questions and uh, maybe try to summarize, please. Thanks, Charles. Um, Ian Henderson from UNEP Finance Initiative. Uh, this is a question for Martin. Um, we, we talked a fair bit, and Pat Herro just, just touched on this concept of uh, public sector funds enabling private sector funds. And given we're close to, to Christmas, um, and also given your perspective of having worked for development banks um, as well as on the private sector, I mean, what specifically would you ask for? What tangible... I've, I've probably asked you this before over lunch, but what tangible things would you ask for that could make your life easier, um, either you know, in terms of the capital raising you've just been through, but also in the identification of your, your investment pipeline? And I know the two are interlinked. So just maybe a couple of really practical, um, feasible, short to medium term things that the international community could provide that would do what we always talk about, which is leveraging private sector finance. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, it's Matt Leggett from the Global Canopy Program. Um, thanks very much for your presentations. Um, interesting as always. Um, my question is kind of linked to the questions from uh, the various UN organizations at the front there. Um, and, and I suppose partly to Mario, um, what opportunities or what in appetite do you think there might be for using public sector red financing um, to assist the funding of the transition to sustainable agriculture for some of these big commodity producers that you find in Indonesia and other parts of the world? So that's the first question. And then secondly, um, I, I guess feeding on from... Actually, no, I'll leave it there, because I actually want to just hear the end into that one. Right. Um, let, I don't see any other hand. Yes, there's one. Tim Milley from, Mer from Meridian Institute. Um, this is just a clarification question for um, the gentleman from Moringa. Uh, can you just describe a little bit about the nature of the investments that you're making and the degree to which uh, carbon credits for verified emissions reductions play a role in your, your uh, analysis of the return on investment, et cetera? Thank you. Very good. Um, maybe Martin, you would want to take the floor first, or Mario, or... Let me go to Martin. I think most of the questions were addressed to you. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you for, for those, those questions. Um, and I'll try my best to answer them. They're not necessarily easy questions uh, uh, to answer, but um, maybe just in the order, of, in the order that they came. Um, uh, if I understand your question rightly, it's how, to, how, how, do we, how do we make sure that everybody understands the interest of an actor like us um, getting public sector support in some sense vis-a-vis -vis others. Um, I, I, and and how, how will civil, civil society see that? I, I, the, the, the simplest answer I can give, I think, is that the, the proof is in the pudding. And I think that we're, um, we, we talk a lot about our, uh, our, our strategy publicly, um, the importance of making sure that, the, that sustainability in all its forms is present. That means making profitable investments, which will hopefully encourage further investments to be made by us and others in the future. It includes making sure that uh, we produce the win-win the situation on the ground for ourselves and local people. Um, we, we see one of the particular interesting uh, inherent properties of agroforestry is that it does allow us to easily engage local people and smallholders uh, to produce crops and also to grow trees. Um, so I think that um, uh, we have a, a solid platform for doing that. We need to show that that is what happens. Uh, the first project we'll do, uh, we hope in, a, in the early part of next year, will be uh, an entirely smallholder based agroforestry um, uh, uh, strategy uh, project in West Africa producing different oils. Um, so I, I think that uh, the simplest way for us to speak to that question is to show by our actions that the kind of projects we're backing are solid from a civil society perspective as well as profitable from our, our perspective and not forgetting the environmental side that we produce the benefits of agroforestry in terms of soil refertilization that, that, that can come out to when projects are properly, um, properly uh, um, d designed. But then that's the, the, the best way of answering the question. I think it's, it's what comes out and we will, once we have invested in projects, we will 
um, talk about them uh, with, with great enthusiasm, I think, um, and, and, and one by one be able to come to that point uh, in a concrete way. Um, I think I might save the Christmas present one for last uh, because, that's, uh, that's, uh, of course, that's a nice thing to think, to think about uh, in some ways. On the, um, on the carbon credit side, uh, our investments are uh, very much into the fabric of the underlying project and business. So our, uh, the return that our projects make is um, from the sale of uh, biomass and, and wood from the forest uh, side of things. It's from the sale of agricultural products very often into local markets, by the way. We don't exclude international markets, but very often we're selling into local markets. The oil project I mentioned is exclusively servicing local markets for edible oils and, and combustible oils. Um, over, the, over our entire portfolio, about 65% of our revenues will come from the forestry side, biomass and wood, about 30% from, uh, from the agricultural side, and I would say up to 5% from carbon credits and other environmental uh, credits that we can derive. Uh, so it is a component, um, but it's not a component which makes the difference between a project being financeable or not. We will do our utmost to, to, to produce carbon credits, environmental services uh, oriented credits. Um, we think we have a solid platform in the sense that our projects should have a, a solid sustainability brand associated with them. Uh, and for private markets within that, uh, that's a, a key point. So it's definitely present, but it's not an overwhelming factor in the, in the thing. Um, and I, on, the, on the public sector, uh, what would I like for, uh, for Christmas side? Um, <laughs> uh, I think, uh, you know, we, have, we think we have the, uh, the starting blocks have been put in place. And I, I like the wall analogy that was, just, uh, that was just mentioned. I think that the analogy is that the public sector puts in place the concrete and then the private sector builds the wall on top. Uh, we, we're going to start doing that because we feel that the, the first 10 meter stretch has been done, if you like, by the public sector. Uh, I think... Uh, at this stage, there are no neatly wrapped things we need. I think we'd like to be accompanied, to be watched, to be observed, to be supported. And, and there's been some discussions going on already that I've had uh, today where people are taking interest in what we're doing. I think we'd like people to take an interest in what we're doing. Um, and to the extent that it makes sense to, uh, to follow us along that first 10 meters of the wall. And when we get to the end of the first 10 meters and take a look at all the different posts that are propping up our, our wall, which, which may illustrate flaws in the foundations and then be ready to, to work on the next 10 meters uh, with us and that would be the best way to describe it. Thank you very much. Um, Mario? Yes. So I was in the first place to respond to the question from uh, Global Canopy on you know, what opportunities there are to use uh, red funds, or I would say funds that are catalyzed by red to address um, agriculture issues or issues in the agriculture sector. And I think that also allows me to address a very good comment from, from Pairo. I knew I was going to get myself into trouble <laughs> with him. After all, he's an engineer, I'm a carpenter. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, the, and again, let me respond to that with, with, with an example. That, um, so take a country um, where um, a significant part of the economy is dependent on an export commodity, an agriculture export commodity. And you know, that's, that commodity produces, um, contributes to 1% of the GDP, $10 billion uh, of um, export revenues. So it's a commodity that needs to be produced. In a business as usual approach, you know. Uh, the plantations required to produce that commodity, whether it's a palm oil, timber, or soya, uh, in an environment where there is no more agriculture, arable land available, you would go uh, into the forest. Uh, so the question is, you know, in practice, how do you turn that around? And um, I think this came up also you know, today, as I mentioned. You know, different landscapes have different mix of solutions. So in the first place you will, you will look at, is there already deforested land that is being suboptimally uh, utilized where the plantation can be developed? And, you know, in a number of countries, the, the answer is yes. There is some land that can be uh, used for that. The problem is that the land has no uh, secure land use rights. So for, for a company to invest, say, developing its 200,000 hectares of plantation uh, on a uh, 
uh, deforested land where there are contested land use rights, where it is not clear what ownership you know, is being associated with uh, uh, communities, it's a very risky business. So, you know, the company would, as a matter of preference, go into forested lands where the, those uh, land use rights uh, are not adapted and it's easier. Uh, to develop its own plantation. So the public sector investments, and it's not only public sector funding, it's investment also in terms of political investments, would be in this particular case there of addressing uh, the tenure issues and the land use rights. And, and there's a cost associated uh, with that, and it is that cost that the public sector investment that is triggered by the red proposition, not all of it is going to come from red, that is going to be used to actually low, to address those governance uh, barriers and, and lower the barriers of entry for, for the private sector. Then the question is, you know, and, you know, and again, we don't have to build that wall for 100 meters, but at least you need to start building uh, you know, enough of a foundation so that you can uh, put up uh, the wall. And, and here I have a, a, a question you know, to Martin and, and Pyro. Do you think, is, are there out there enough places where this wall can be built at a scale that is uh, sufficient and, um, and reflects the type of challenge that we have ahead? So uh, do, do we have these conditions in place on areas that go beyond the few thousand hectares uh, and that actually represents the type of challenge that we have ahead of us in the next 10 years if we really want to scale it up. Thank you very much, Mario. Um, there was a specific question addressed to Paheru, um, mm -hmm. and now another one. Um, I would like to give you the floor, and then maybe Sarah would uh, take over. Thank you. Gosh, university question, very difficult. Uh, you're asking if the, the department and the government can handle landscape approach. And that's what I will say, that uh, the difficulties get more when you get into the details. Even if that is on a nationally macro level. I have a very interesting example that I'm going to share at the closing plenary later on. Okay. So come to the plenary. <laughs> <laughs> but the point is, basically, the case was about the way that the need for us to have self-sufficiency in rice is an issue of food security. When you're talking about the issue of food security, the landscape approach needs to be added with a lot of appendices. How do you deal with the need for import when we have this agreement with India and Vietnam? How do we deal with the conditions whereby your input for the plenty, for the paddy field is actually not flowing well? How do you deal with the middleman? How do you deal with the need for us to provide food for the poor at a very subsidized price? Now, try to solve that with the landscape approach. It's not that easy. That is at that level, when you're talking about from the national down to the real on the ground level. Landscape approach to me is a very good approach when you're talking about projects. But when you scale up, into real jurisdictional problem, real national social problem, real international connections, then you face a big wall. And that is where we have the difficulty still in terms of that. Not saying that the landscape approach is useless. It's a big progress, but it's not enough. We need to do something more to make it really work on that issue. I would like to also touch a bit on those red issue about uh, how do you make use of that public fund to create the interest for the private funds? We know that when you're talking about the smallholders in the palm oil, uh, palm oil industry, 
they burn their land because they need to prepare the land before they plant. And that's the way that is cheap. Private investment wants to come in if you, public fund, prepare the land for them to land. Okay? Regulations must be better, must be conducive for that, and other things. Institution, institution, capacity of the people who's making licenses has to be good, and not only that, also attitude and accountability needs to be good, such that the private funds will be interested to come in and later on generate result, return. Now the return that is being di discussed here should not only merely be carbon. Carbon is very elusive. But like, like other commodity, carbon is also very difficult to uh, uh, project to the future. So I agree very much with Martin's approach. It's not only the emissions that you are addressing, but also the other benefit when you are doing better in terms of managing your landscape. And that is, people talk about co-benefit. I will say that it's actually the main benefit where carbon is just the carrot that will carry the car. Because the benefit is not that carrot. The other things that you enjoy when you walk through that village lane. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. Yeah, thank you. Very, very interesting discussion. Um, I wanted to comment on a couple of the things that had been been come up. Um, the the first one was about the public funding um, to to support the transition to agriculture. Um, it's been my view for a very long time since the beginning of Red that it, that the original design was fundamentally flawed because it was a sectoral approach. And I think a lot of ministries of forestry jumped on board to it because they saw it even as a source of funding for forestry activities that had historically been so underfunded. But if you step back and looked at the drivers of deforestation, most of the dri not all, but m most of the drivers of deforestation were outside the forestry sector. They were in agriculture. They were in mining. And so the, uh, conceptually, the idea of RED should, should be to modify the drivers. And I think it, it does involve, we did, a, we did a major study a couple of years ago, I'm happy to share at some point, about all of the ways in which someone interested in red out, or con countries interested in red outcomes, could alternatively spend the money uh, of red. And I think a lot of it is around agricultural transition. But I think there's a highly simplistic model that's being promoted by some people out there, that if we increase agricultural you know, productivity, it will magically convert into a reduction in deforestation. And I think there's only a few places in the world with particular low populations and particularly alternative livelihoods where that is the case. And I think one of the things that's the real opportunity of landscape approaches in dealing with red is getting specific agreements between certain groups of farmers that they can get access to credit and technical assistance for conversion to sustainable agriculture in exchange for agreements around the conservation of forests. And I think there's a number of, of very interesting um, places, pl places where that kind of arrangement's been done. But I think we do need to think out of the box, and if we think intersectorally, I think, I think it really helps us. I would say that, that some of the challenges that you were, you were posing for food security, that's I think the thing we are centrally concerned about, can be sometimes addressed through collaborative process among sectors. Um, you've seen it in the way that you've had collaborative process around pre-competitive um, value chain development. I think you can address some of those issues, but by no means all, and I think personally that it's valuable to think of the landscapes as something nested within a larger green economy that has to set the rules of the game and even internationally to, to deal with trade. So the, the last thing um, that, I, that I wanted to respond to was the, the question about the public sector foundation for, for private investment. Um, I, because I think this is something that does seem to be quite important to catalyze a lot of private sector investment. Certain things need to be in place. But there is a limited amount of public sector funding. And I think one of the things that we saw, I, I saw as a, as a challenge in the Tanzania example that I was just mentioning, uh, the green economy the, you know, group was recommending a whole range of public sector functions that we felt needed to be beefed up in order to enable an agricultural green growth strategy. 
but the government was really didn't have a lot of space, <laughs> um, you know, in their in their capacity because the private sector companies that were being in, in you know basically being encouraged to come in and invest also had a long laundry list of demands that were you know at least requests from the government around clarifying taxation around clarifying uh, arrangements for what could be imported around uh, clarifying arrangements for hiring ex expatriate experts there they had a whole laundry list and when you were dangling the 2 or 3 billion dollars you know kind of kind of there you know there was a tendency for those requirements and those subsidies they required government co-financing for infrastructure so whereas one might be wanting for a green economy to see co-financing of other kinds of investments, the, the lack of having an integrated vision of what the set of investments needed to be ended up taking up all the space and the subsidies all, all ended up being more for some of these private sector investments uh, rather than the smallholder investments or the ecosystem investments or some of the reorganizing your water utilization strategies for the country. So. Thank you very much. I, I want to yes, I, I just wanted to respond on the issue of governments and um, landscapes. I want to take an example of Kenya because that's the country I come from, although maybe it applies even to most of East Africa and other countries in Africa. At the moment, we have new constitutions, and these new constitutions are actually recognizing communities. If I am to take an example of Kenya, we have the Community Land Bill. The community land bill is still a bill, it's not yet been passed, but it's very favorable to communities, especially uh, pastoralist communities. We are able now to take care of our, our lands, the land tenure systems, and it actually recognizes our own um, governance systems, traditional governance systems of land. That is something that I think is really something very good for, for us as a community, as pastoralist communities. And I also want to say that uh, we, we have ministries Right now, in Kenya, we used to have the, the Ministry of Arid uh, Assals, Arid and Semi-Arid Lands. And we write our own sessional papers, we have our own discussions, we have our own uh, um, debates. This has now been replaced by something else, Ministry of Culture and something, which is still okay, because most of what we used to do under the, the, the Assals Ministry is still very much, pretty much the same. So we feel that we are able to discuss our own issues, whether it's red, uh, red uh, green economy, and, and uh, climate change adaptation and mitigation on our own, what favors us as counties. Mm -hmm. So we are now taking advantage of the opportunity we are having on devolution in Kenya. The devolved governance now has given us powers to decide on our own, to, 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 uh, to debate on our own issues, and so the only thing we don't take control of is the national parks. Of course, that comes under the, the, the national governance, which is fine. It, that, that's still uh, under our, our, our land, but it was something that has, was taken a long time ago. There's nothing we can do about it right now. But there is a very big opportunity for us now to control our own economy, our own land, and to make uh, decisions. Uh, there's something very interesting that's happening in Kenya, and I hope I'm not taking too much time, is that now we have extractive industries. Oil has just been discovered in northern Kenya. Water has just been discovered again in northern Kenya. And uh, we have a lot of projects coming up, the, the, the windmills, the wind power. I think Martin actually, when he was in African Bank, Development Bank, they funded that. And so you can, you can imagine the, all the, the only um, thing that we did not like, especially when it comes to all these developments, and the lapse, the, the, there is a corridor. We're making all the, the, the World Bank is giving a lot of money for making, connecting Kenya and Ethiopia and Sudan, right. you know, that's the lapse. And with all that, it's passing through our land. So we're losing a lot of grazing land. What I was telling you, they call idle land. And idle land, is not, it's not idle land, it's grazing land. And we're losing a lot of that. And we did not have FPIC, the free prior and informed consent. That is now something that we are fighting for. And now that we have devolved governance, we are able to say no. So that is also an ongoing process. And there are so many processes that are going on. And we have opportunities to actually intervene and make decisions. So we have some, some opportunities with, with this governance now. Thank you.
Very good. Um, I think this um, is a very good um, uh, discussion. Let me see if um, I can have a, a sort of midterm review of the discussion so far. Um, RED is a very important undertaking, but as Sarah uh, reminded us, most of the deforestation act uh, activities are driven by activities that are happening outside of the forest or coming to the forest from outside, uh, including mining, agriculture, and so forth. These are the drivers, so they need to be taken into account. And the management of the forest cannot be transformative unless we address these external uh, factors. What I've also heard uh, uh, um, panelists saying is that the issue of landscapes has to be taken there is an issue of scale, in, in other words. Uh, it, it works very well so far at the project level because that is a, a scale that is easier to handle and conceptually we have been working in projects. But it also works at the regional scale, as Sarah mentioned in the, south, in the case of southern uh, Tanzania, where actually you take a larger scale and you try to make it work there. It actually should work at the national level uh, and I would like to use the example and maybe ask uh, Pahero to explain a little bit what Indonesia in doing, in is doing uh, for its one map uh, concept where actually they are trying to bring coherence to the whole mapping system at the national level. So that's, that's a landscape approach, looking at the national uh, scale and saying we have to stop having sectoral maps, agriculture, mining, forestry, that do not speak to each other and you end up having chaos. So let's have one map which will be the only reference at the national level. But actually, Paheru, you also took the helicopter view or maybe the satellite view uh, as you were supporting your president as co-chair of the high-level panel where you actually saw half of the planet. I, I guess it was daytime. And in the nighttime, you will see the, other half, see the other half of the planet. And you actually came up with some suggestions about SDGs sustainable development goals. We can, we can say this is also a landscape approach in the sense that we are trying to see to have more coherence into what we ought to do as human beings in order to safeguard our planet as a whole. And some scientists have come up with this concept of um, uh, planetary boundaries, which is also a sort of landscape view of how we should manage our planet. So I would like to bring the discussion back to you as panelists and see, maybe you can unpack this issue of scale and see how it can work at, at different scales. Can I start with you, Pahil? Sure. Very good, Pahil. By the way, Pa in Bahasa Indonesia means sir. <laughs> so, it's very interesting. When you touch on the one map project or program, we look into the maps that Indonesia have and some of the map is not, not only not talking to each other, but contradict each other. Especially when you overlay that with the licenses that is given. And so in some of the provinces or districts, the amount of land that is available is actually less than what is given to the licenses. <laughs> so this is unacceptable. And because of that, the president said, do a one map project with four points. First, you have to have one reference. Second, you have to have one standard. Third, you have to have one uh, terminology. And the fourth, you have to have one geoportal so that you can <laughs> geoport geoportal. Geoport so basically what we are saying is that our map become very transparent. Everybody can make comments. Everybody can actually change. If they say that this is not right, go to the data custodian. The data custodian will make a double check and then put the map corrections into that. But this one map, one, 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 is actually starting with what we call the land shapes, the basic map. Our map that is scaled 1 to 250,000, now built into a 50,000 with 67 layers of information on top of it. So the information of licenses, the information of mining, information of forestry, information of agriculture, they are all put on top of that. So you can say that actually the one map project is like a landscape project 
But within that, you create the layers that needs to be done. So landscape approach is not saying that it's only one sheet. It has to be having all those layers being done as well. Now, when we move into the global scale on the Sustainable Development Goals post-2015 development agenda, what will happen very strongly are actually three things. It has to be sustainable, number one, in terms of eradicating poverty as well. And the second is that you are talking about global goal in national targets. So even if you're talking about landscape approach, you're not talking about one size fits all. You say that what is appropriate for that particular sub-landscape, what is appropriate for that particular sub-landscape needs to be defined. Because otherwise, the problem is not solved. Otherwise, okay, so the conflict will continue. And the third process, the third imperative is global partnership. You have to do that globally so that WTO needs to be changed. The rules of financial flow needs to be changed. When you're talking about migration, you're not only talking about workforce or poverty or uh, remittance. You have to see that from the whole concept of the human being uh, well-being. Okay, human well-being like the green economy was saying. So it is complex. Once you get into a higher level, I will not say that it cannot be done, but we have the ability to do it. I think that is the challenge. And if we have 190 cooks trying to prepare the same soup, it will be very different. <laughs> it will be very difficult. And that's what we are trying to address climate change with. 190 countries trying to solve the same problem. Maybe the details are different from each country. So landscape approach is an ideal approach, needs to be done, needs to be continuously pushed into the real reality at the highest level. Start with a small level, works, move up. But not only you're talking about the proof of concept, you need to also do the proof of application. Is that applied? What is good in Kenya, is it applied for Indonesia? But it's good in Indonesia, it's applied for Australia, uh, and, and so forth. So this program will actually, or this movement, this trajectory, is actually talking about we cannot afford to not have UNEP, we cannot afford to not have research done, we cannot afford not to have programs and projects done at the level that we can learn from. So I think that is the message they can give you. Thank you very much, uh, We do have some questions from Twitter, uh, and I have one for Mario. I, I'm addressing it to Mario, um, which is the following. What is the link between Red Plus and the green economy? Is it true that in applying the green economy, the green economy approach, you could have a Red Plus program in a particular country or region or a basin like uh, so the Congo Basin, uh, that would be beneficial to society, will support local communities, and will contribute to national development plans based on sustainable development goals. Is that correct? Is it feasible? Yeah. Or is it an illusion? <laughs> um, question. And, and I think that question also connects to the previous question about uh, scale. Uh, and so, let me provide an answer that maybe can be tweeted back. <laughs> uh, that is that, you know, red plus has an important role to play as a catalyst. And I think it will play a role as a catalyst beyond the carbon payments that may come at the end of the process, I think this is something that both Martin and Baheru uh, were mentioning. And it can play a role as a catalyst because it's bringing the political attention now on the need to address the drivers of deforestation. And to do that in a way that will not undermine the economic development of a country, but it will actually promote it in a, in a way that will bring both social and environmental uh, benefits. And red 
can play a role as a catalyst also because it has already, if you want, a critical mass of champions behind it that have passed, if you want, the proof of concept, have passed the sniff test and have said, <laughs> clearly, this can be done. And that beyond that, there is already, I think, a critical mass of investment from countries such as you know, Norway and, and others that have put uh, real money on the table to invest early on on the you know, public sector uh, type of uh, reforms that are needed at the beginning. And to me then, the way I would like to connect this to your question at, at scale is because if we want to succeed in achieving the overall ambition that is that of you know, achieving sustainable developments in, in this lifetime and, and uh, keeping this planet on a trajectory of a less than two or three degrees temperature increase, things need to change in the next you know, 10 to 20 years. Uh, and so what is really uh, needed is a tipping point. It's a tipping point that will allow these islands of performance, these you know, first 10 meters of the wall that has been built, to be scaled up and replicated um, at a pace that is unprecedented. And that I think is something that RED can catalyze because it can give the push at this point in time by bringing the political support that it has, by bringing the champions that are standing behind it, by bringing the initial early finance that is coming to really activate the replication uh, uh, of these activities uh, in other countries and in other jurisdictions. Mm -hmm. So, you want to continue? Uh, sure. sure. I, I was going to get back to the to the scale so issue. Scale, yeah. Is that what you want? So I, I have a couple of thoughts that came up when when we were discussing the issue of scale. I don't think of landscape personally as a project. I think because projects are usually short term, and landscape this is about long term, local and landscape level stakeholder collaboration it needs to be institutionalized. And I think there's sometimes they've been promoted by projects, sometimes they've been re been in basically like what was just being described in northern Kenya. These are you know locally based institutions, but I uh, and I also tend so I, I do tend to think of landscapes because they're so socio-ecological units of, of, of where people and ecosystems are interacting. Um, uh, that it's not necessarily at the level of the whole world, um, but what when I, when when I think about landscapes, I do think about them being at quite varying scale because it's defined by the problem that the stakeholders are trying to achieve or the barrier and problem that the stakeholders are trying to address. And so in the case of the corridor, if it dis de requires a shift at the level of an entire corridor, I think you've got your green prosperity programs to quite large scale initiatives. Or if it's we really need to make sure this sub-watershed gets the river running year round, then it's the people who live within the, so it's quite variable. And I think all of those groups and stakeholders can, for example, utilize the map that you produce, but the map doesn't define the landscape, it's the people that are using it that define the landscape. But one of the things that I think I, I would say is there's a landscape approach, there's a landscape perspective that is something that I think is important to go all the way up from national to global level. If you're an agribusiness firm that's going to make an investment of a billion dollars to expand your access to cocoa or whatever it may be, if your only thinking is I am, wherever I invest, there will be a monoculture of cocoa that will supply this supply chain and our resources will all be mobilized around cocoa, it's a very different perspective than one where I know I will be investing in an area where high agrobiodiversity will be important for resilience over the long term in this landscape. I know we're going to have to be collaborating with other forest people and water managers in this sense. The design of their investment would be different if they also have a landscape perspective. And I think this work that the Landscape for People, Food and Nature Initiative finance working group 
has been doing is suggesting that there really are some quite significant ways in which the structure of financing, the criteria for financing, um, the kind of data needed for those who are investing is quite different if you have a landscape perspective. So it doesn't mean they're going to operate in, at the landscape scale, but it means they'll do their work or the national government will do their work in a way as you were describing here, that actually empowers local people to make quite a lot of decisions about their future and to negotiate with ex external actors about the directions that they're moving. So I think there's going to be a tension, but a hopefully a very innovative and constructive tension as we both catalyze the, the shift in institutions at those scales and also um, support uh, stakeholders in landscapes to more systematically collaborate together around some common visions of what they want, which will likely differ from, from place to place. So. Good, excellent. Something tells me that uh, people may want to uh, ask additional questions, so please be prepared. That I'm going to give the floor back to the audience. But before that, uh, Martin uh, has something to say. Yeah, uh, the, the, the question of scale, I think, and the way it's used in the public sector is, is, is something which is quite hard to, for private sector folks to get their heads around uh, uh, and so for us <laughs> for us it's more about um, if you like uh, um, high quality success stories on a, on a at a very local level I would say that's what we're striving to do we're striving to build successful businesses which are profitable which uh, have positive environmental and social impacts but um, that happens uh, regionally I would say even locally for us big scale is four or five thousand hectares, four or five thousand smallholders, and that's big scale for us. Uh, and so I think um, what happens on the scale of countries, regions, continents is something we don't really think very much about, but it does have a relevance to us in the sense, of course, that uh, um, you know, we, we are potentially providing examples, specific examples of successes in terms of how to build sustainable business, which has a positive context in the, when you look at it from a landscape perspective. And so that's where the connection with the public sector, I think, is for us, that uh, once we are um, producing, building these businesses, that that is observed, watched, communicated, and that we can get support from the public sector to diffuse success stories more largely. And that's where the two agendas start to, I think, uh, really intersect. And there was a point uh, related to, to the question you put about civil society, which I didn't mention in my response. And that is that what we're doing with Moringa is, is mainly applying, if you like, a private sector mechanism to a particular uh, challenge, which is to invest in, in, in agroforestry businesses. But we are doing that by using some public funds. So our investor base includes public investors and private investors, and they are channeling their funds, both constituencies, through that private sector mechanism. Um, but, and this is a rather obvious thing to say, but at the end of the day, they do expect us to give back uh, the, uh, the money that they, that they invest uh, in us. So that's, it's, it's just to, I, think I, I didn't really answer your question very well, um, but they have given us that money because they think that in a second or third stage, when things have been proven to work well, that they can step back and private money will then come in and, and all of those good things to do with, um, if you like, cat catalytic effects on private money, all that starts to happen. Right. Now is your chance to... Wake up, not leave, but wake up. <laughs> um, can we have the mic, please? Any, anybody want? Yeah, please. Thank you. It's uh, me, um, Miss Brigitte from DRC. I have one question. Because for me, I think um, when a country uh, decided to, to make some uh, red plus activities, if this country, um, uh, I have to say, doesn't identify or uh, doesn't want to address the, the driver of deforestation, I, I think red plus is for me um, like utopia. And my question is, it is same because I explained my question. <laughs> How can a country uh, keep its uh, additional of uh, uh, um, level reference of its forest 
in a poverty context where people need energy and food. Thank you very much. Uh, another question here? Um, um, thanks very much, the panel. Um, my name is Henrietta Boyd. I'm um, from a company, company called Permian Global, also another private sector actor looking to bring um, private capital to the landscape, this landscape, if you like. Um, so you've obviously been talking about a subject close to my heart. Um, and well done, Martin, answering all the questions so beautifully. Um, and that this might sound like a question that's going a little bit off topic, but everybody's been talking about deforestation and the drivers of deforestation. Does anyone have any comments? I'd just be interested to hear if anyone has any comments about forest degradation and the importance of forest degradation at a landscape scale. Any other question? This may be the last round, so please don't miss the opportunity. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Second row, yeah. Hello, um, my name is Rosemary Bissett, and I'm from National Australia Bank. Um, and we have a large agricultural customer base, but mostly in developed countries. Um, I think the focus of land on landscapes in developing countries is critical. Um, and we need to think of innovative ways to help make it happen. But I have a question around the parallels to developed countries, because if you think about the sustainable development goals, what that will do is actually enlarge the concept of sustainable development to make sure we bring in developed countries. And we have natural assets and resources in developed countries that are sadly still being de degraded despite our developed country status. Given the key learnings that are happening in developing countries, what do you think the knowledge transfer may be back, particularly from indigenous communities to developed countries, so that what we don't get is a situation where developing countries are working like crazy to preserve their natural assets and we continue on a path of degradation in developed countries? Hello, I'm Fabisi from Cameroon. I'm a, thank you for the fantastic presentations and discussions. I'm looking at the topic landscape in the green economy. I'm just wondering, it is true that um, uh, red is often cited as an example um, uh, of an activity under a green economy agenda. But in addition to that, the speakers are talking about smallholder farmers, small scale, agricultural activities, what of this big government development agenda, like in the Congo Basin, where they, they have um, a very big um, a vision of, of emerging in the coming years? Um, where do we situate issues like mining in a green um, uh, economy agenda, or within the landscape discussion? Is this an example, or is it out of the loop? Right. Last question there. Yes, please. Hi. I'm, I'm Jesse Gersten from the Clinton uh, Climate Initiative in Indonesia. This is uh, an open question. Um, we heard from uh, we heard from Martin that uh, that the um, uh, the landscapes as we're talking about it doesn't necessarily line up with how private sector sees investments. Uh, and my question is simply, um, by having these discussions about landscapes, do you think that we're distancing ourselves from the private sector? Okay, good. Uh, we have a series of questions. Let's see how we can bundle them. Uh, I don't think we can respond to them one by one, but um, any of the panelists may want to address any of the questions that have been asked. Uh, essentially, we have uh, this issue of uh, competing needs. Um, 
as uh, raised by Bridget from DRC. Um, we have um, um, the um, question about forest degradation. We have, I think, uh, the question is, you know, it's not only uh, em reduced emission from forest, um, from deforestation, but also from forest uh, degradation. Uh, SDGs are universal by in, in nature. Uh, so they are not only designed for developing countries, it is also for industrialized countries. And if there is some knowledge that can be brought back, from, uh, uh, especially indigenous knowledge that could be shared with uh, some developing countries, is the issue of landscape narrowly focused or does it address, does it address the issue of mining and uh, other illegal, uh, legal or illegal exploitation of, of resources? And is the issue of landscape incompatible with private sector? investment. Sarah? Sure. <laughs> I'd like to address a couple of those. I'll, I'll try to do it very briefly. Um, the, the, the first one is that there's actually a lot more landscape activity in developed countries than I had any idea a few years ago. There's actually quite an old European landscape convention that was signed by more countries than are in the um, EU, actually, the European Commission passed, although its focus was more on conservation of landscapes. And that whole model is apparently within Europe being re rethought to focus more also on some of these production and other activities. And there is a proliferation of landscape initiatives. And we've actually been approached by um, the EU, EU, EU some Commission on Agriculture and Environment because they wanted to go and find the lessons from Kenya and from other places that were doing integrated landscape initiatives because they were using a subsidy approach to manage environmental issues in agriculture and would like to shift to a collaborative approach. Um, in terms of the mining question, I just wanted to bring your attention. Um, I think it is one of the most complex issues about landscape um, collaboration whenever there's very large-scale external investors that are almost by their nature degrading. But the Gaborone Declaration that was signed by heads of state in, in Africa uh, last year actually had some very specific guidance around how to do, you know, how, what the expectations should be of how um, uh, mining would be incorporated into sustainable landscapes. So I just wanted to, to bring that to your attention. And finally, the question about private sector interest in landscape is one that um, has been a, a, a lot of concern to the coalition of, of groups working with this um, Landscapes for People, Food, and Nature initiative. And we have a business working group that was asking this question because when we did a review in Latin America and Africa, uh, there, of the, of the sample I was telling you about, only 4% of the landscape initiatives in Latin America involved private companies. And in Africa, none of the ones we actually interviewed involved, I think there was one that involved private companies. Um, so the, there was seriously a, a problem of major stakeholders in the landscapes not, not playing along in the game, right? Um, so uh, we, had, we, we, we commissioned, the, the working group commissioned a, um, uh, a review, uh, a scoping exercise, and they actually found 27 companies that had, uh, this was international companies, that were actively involved in landscape initiatives. And the question was, why did you do it? What was the business case for doing it? And what came out of it, that I won't go into all the details, I do have here though. Um, what came out was the principal drivers for them getting involved is that they were reassessing the risks to their supply chains and many of them saw climate change, community, the needs for communities to do other things than the things they were involved with and, uh, and, and water as actually quite significant risks for them that they felt they could not manage only within their supply chain. So they wanted to go out, reach out to stakeholders outside their, their supply chains. Um, and we did a couple of more in-depth interviews about the different modalities that they do it. And quite interesting to me, this is, there's actually a lot of buzz around this at the Sustainable Food Lab, and, and now we were recently approached by Nestle's to try to pull together something that, that would bring more discussion with CEOs of, of companies, both international and national. So I actually think there's, there are real concerns by the companies that have long-term time horizons for supply chains um, that they're going to have to think beyond uh, just the farmers that are producing for them. Very good. Excellent. Um, I'm looking at my panelists to see. Uh, this is your last chance also to, to say a few words <laughs> because I, I need to give the floor to the reporter. Uh, can you briefly address some of the questions, Mario? Yeah. Uh, then yeah. Again, all of them very good questions. Maybe I'll focus on one that hasn't been touched yet, which to do with the knowledge uh, transfer and knowledge management. 
I think that's the essence. Uh, it's a fundamental error that we need to work on at every level. Uh, transfer uh, south-south, south-north, north-south, across <laughs> constituency. Um, what we are attempting here is something that has never been done before. It's, you know, for those familiar with the Kuznets curse, uh, you know, a country will uh, uh, cut down its uh, forest cover as it develops and then the forests will uh, grow back as the country has developed. What we're trying to do here is to tunnel through and to tunnel through at a scale uh, and in a time frame that is unprecedented. So, what we, and what we have been doing, even in the case of, you know, programs like the UN RED and the World Bank FCPF in the last five years is, you know, to to work on what we call readiness and figure out how is it that you do this, what is it that we can learn so that in the next five to ten years we can scale this up. And clearly there's a lot that has been learned uh, so far, uh, there's a lot uh, of knowledge that is, you know, with indigenous people, with communities, with the different stakeholders that hasn't made it up yet. And so it's below the surface, it's the bottom part of, um, of the iceberg. And that is also one reason why we are facing, you know, still so much skepticism uh, out there in terms of, um, you know, can this really be delivered in the time frame that we have? So a major effort going forward is to make sure that, you know, the knowledge, the know-how that uh, has been produced in many cases still in the heads uh, of people is all connected, is all made available. Uh, because it is on that uh, knowledge that we're going to give a future uh, to Red as a catalyst for a landscape approach, as a catalyst for green economy. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mario. Um, Agnes? I, I just want to add only one word to what Mario has said in, in connection to the sharing of knowledge. I just want to emphasize, and I always say this, documentation and more documentation. Documentation of all our knowledge mm -hmm. systems, and then sharing of that knowledge. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Martin? Martin? Yeah, uh, just to uh, comment on a couple of the questions raised. Uh, the, the forest degradation question, it's a Moringa comment, but we see that as an opportunity. Uh, we can prevent, potentially prevent things from going further in the wrong direction than they have done already by implementing inside degraded forests. Um, cohesive agroforestry models which retain what is there and, and make that, uh, if you like, a productive and stable agroforestry asset for the future. So it's not quite your question, but we see as an opportunity to, to, to implement our strategy. Um, and then the other question uh, uh, about uh, private sector, whether the landscape discussion is a barrier to, to bring in the private sector. The Moringa response is, is simply no, because our legitimacy, if you like, comes exactly from that discussion. And, and, and so that's where we find our place in, in uh, intellectually and also from a business perspective and other perspectives, exactly in that discussion. What I think is probably a bit um, tricky sometimes is that um, uh, the meaning of words like landscape, I think there were 80 definitions already uh, <laughs> mentioned, particularly for private sector people, that would be potentially a hard one to get their heads around. And, and uh, I think it's, it's important that people make progress on, um, on uh, defining what exactly the landscape approach uh, involves and, and allow people to understand better <coughs> what it means. In recent times, uh, some of you may be familiar with some, uh, a type of investor called an impact investor, uh, which is a, an investor who seeks environmental and social impact above all else. In the past, that has been a, and still is a misunderstood term whereby um, uh, people don't understand that often you need to associate the financial side with that to have a sustainable model going on. But much progress has been made on defining impact and so impact investors increasingly find their place uh, and, and, and a more normal dialogue with groups like ours when it comes to uh, understanding how they can cont contribute to, to, to us and what they get out of um, uh, the Moringa approach. And I think on the, on the um, uh, what I see happening in investment funds who are operating in, la in, in uh, landscape relevant areas is probably a kind of convergence in the coming years where as people understand better what it means, those of us on the investment side who today are calling themselves an agri-fund, a forestry fund, an agroforestry fund, a carbon fund, those models begin to converge as people better understand and can situate themselves better in, in, this, in this overall discussion. And so whether we should call ourselves an agroforestry fund or, for example, a resource efficiency fund is a discussion we have from time to time because it is a real discussion and you know, things will evolve to a more common view of, of, of what funds can do in this area. Very good. Bye, Hill. 
the approach that we are using in Red Plus implementation in Indonesia is go beyond carbon and more than forest. Because if we stuck our head into the carbon issue, we see very dark. So we need to look beyond carbon. The benefits other than carbon is important. And because of that, you're talking about the link with energy and food become natural. So if you just look into Red Plus as a carbon driven thing, then it's very difficult to resolve the, com the competition and the complexity of security, food security and energy security. But if you look at beyond carbon and more than just forest, then you can see it in that context. And perhaps that is called the landscape approach. <laughs> so you're talking about red plus beyond carbon, more than forest is the landscape approach. More and more I see the blurring of the boundaries between red plus landscape approach and green economy. Because the green economy is the, actually what Sarah has mentioned, landscape at the highest level is green economy. Okay, so I think that is how it actually merged into that. I would like to make a comment in terms of that knowledge sharing. Believe me not, there is this sentiment that we don't want our knowledge to be stolen. That the consultant that comes in with the ODA is actually stealing our knowledge and being used somewhere else that we don't get the dividend for that knowledge. I mean, that is a strong feeling among the indigenous people around the world through the, uh, the approach of the sustainable development goals. We have heard that. And that is something that is very important. I think it's very important to see that if the indigenous knowledge <coughs> is being transported, the only difference between this and the knowledge that is in the developing country, it is not given the intellectual property rights. Well, the intellectual property right from the West, when it gets into the developing country, you have to pay a lot of money. Why not the exchange? So I think this needs to have some discussion as well. How do you exchange this knowledge in a fair way so that the word can be, uh, that can be, uh, what you call it, uh, saved? Now, in terms of distancing, is landscape approach distancing the, the private sector? I will comment, I will say that I came from the private sector before. I was the managing partner of Accenture before. And uh, my point there is that when you're talking about distancing, maybe not distancing, but making it more difficult, making it more complex, because the reality of life is really that complex. You want to make profit, you want to satisfy your stakeholder, shareholders, but at the same time, you're the voice of your shareholders, the stakeholders, is actually getting more and more pronounced. You have to address the stakeholder as well. So it's getting more complex, but that's the nature of the beast. The business moving forward is going to be more complex because we have screwed up the word so far. <laughs> Sorry for the language. <laughs> but on the other side, if we look into the private sector, we can also group the private sector for the group that is uh, in the sight of the drivers of deforestation directly or indirectly. Nestle, I will say, is a driver of deforestation indirectly. <coughs> Unilever, for instance, is a driver of deforestation indirectly because they serve you all and me as well in terms of this consumption of palm oil that is driving the demand like hell because of the increase of the, uh, what you call it, the increase of the middle class. You serve the customer and because of that, you drive the producer to cut the trees. And now you try to stop them, okay, to correct them. So it's actually the group of the drivers of deforestation. I appeal for companies, the private sector, is actually the drivers of Red Plus. Anyone? Drivers of Red Plus. Drivers that actually do the ecosystem restoration, that actually doing a lot and make use of that effort to make benefit, to create benefit, and share the benefit. So for those companies that is actually a driver of Red Plus, getting the benefit that is according to the green economy, landscape approach is the heaven, is the ideal approach. So it's not distancing, but it is actually grabbing 
and embracing the private sector of the new kind. Thank you very much. Uh, the closest of my panelists and the, the one I like the most is actually someone that I have not introduced yet. Uh, and I would like to do so now because she has been taking note and she, wants, she would need at least 10 minutes to report back to you on what you have heard so far. Jane Feehan is Natural Resources Specialist with the European Investment where she has worked since 2008. She's a biologist, she's a forester, which I like a lot again, and she works on the bank's operation in the forestry, fisheries, rural development sectors, both within and outside of Europe. She has been extremely patient, extremely focused, and now I would like to give her the floor to restitute back to us. Can I have the mic please to Jane? And a round of applause too. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, Why don't you stand up? Do you want to stand no, up? She oh, no, you okay. she to read the... um, it would be better to stand up, that's true, but I'm a little bit tied to my, my laptop here where all these notes are kept. Oh, actually, I could do that. Shall I? And you don't need to have a mic. Oh, yeah. Thank you so much, Ibrahim, for that uh, flattering introduction. I shall have to do my very best to live up to that. Um, so what I'd like to do is just spend, spend a couple of minutes going through the main points that came out um, from, from my point of view, from each of the presentations, and also a couple of points from the, the discussion that ensued. And I'd be delighted with any comments or feedback that you might have on the accuracy or otherwise of the, the points that I've chosen to bring out. Um, Ibrahim introduced our session by articulating the value of sustainable landscapes as being at the heart of a new economic paradigm that focuses on natural capital, ecosystem services, resource efficiency and social equity. And there are three relevant concepts which overlap to a certain extent within this, this vision. The landscapes approach, red plus and green economy. Now, as we've observed, the boundaries between these are blurred. And during this session, we had the formidable, I would say, challenge of explaining, defining, demystifying, and ultimately coordinating uh, these three subjects or paradigms. Now, in doing this, our panel, I think, are to be complimented for keeping their feet firmly on the ground. Because I think a common theme which emerged uh, is the need to retain the ability to telescope in and out, out to the, the holistic integrated vision and in to the, the on the ground practices on that farm, in that forest, in that village, because it's here that the, the paradigm actually becomes reality. Um, so firstly, um, our keynote speaker, um, Mario, some of the main points that came out from your presentation for me, um, you, you mentioned uh, Rachel Kite's passionate exposition of the, the triple bottom line uh, of the landscape's approach. And you, you recalled this, this question, you know, if this is truly so, why don't we see rapid upscaling? It's a great question, it deserves a great answer, um, and you outlined five points which can bring us a bit closer to that. Firstly, that business as usual is not an option, and I think that we would all very much agree on that. Secondly, green economy, with its focus on socially and environmentally desirable outcomes. Thirdly, the landscapes approach, which can help us to avoid juxtaposing outcomes on a sector-by-sector -sector basis, rather to uh, bring agriculture and forestry uh, um, much closer together. Fourthly, red, red plus, of course. In fact, um, I was surprised that you didn't put that one that one first, <laughs> considering your role, it was very modest. Um, Red Plus, which can serve as a catalyst for transformation towards a green economy, and you elaborated on that uh, very interestingly later. And then fifthly, 
um, this point, which we returned to several times afterwards, um, the, uh, the, the, the merits of sequencing of public sector and private sector investments, or the, the complementary roles that, that they can play, which aren't necessarily parallel in, 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 uh, in time. The need for public, pu public sector investment first to um, lower the barrier to private sector investment, to establish favorable governance uh, and to address land tenure issues, uh, followed then by uh, private sector investment. So these were the points which came out uh, strongly for me. So then, uh, Sarah, um, the, the points that came out uh, from, from, from your uh, talk most clearly, I think, from, from my point of view, you spoke to your work on gathering and communicating examples of how these principles can be, can be implemented. Um, and on, on, on your work on characterizing the approaches taken, and most importantly, perhaps, enumerating some key success factors. And this is clearly very valuable work. Um, you, you underlined your view that right now there is a particularly good climate for collaboration. And really, collaboration is what we're all about this weekend um, uh, in, this, in this forum. You mentioned two main examples. Firstly, PACT, the PACT group in the Brazilian rainforest, uh, the, the, which has served as an umbrella to, for, for hundreds of organizations to come together. And secondly, um, in Tanzania, the Southern Agricultural Growth Corridor, um, which you described as a, a, having originally been conceived as a, a typical 1960s industrial development. Um, <laughs> shall I delete that bit? Okay. Conventional, just call it I conventional. Put it in British commas. Um, but this in a location which has Ramsar wetlands and has great potential for Red Plus. And so began uh, Eco Agriculture Partners' work on developing a green growth orientated strategy um, in, in this location. And, and you mentioned a number of lessons which emerged from this work uh, the need to build on existing. Uh, strengths, it's scaling up activities which are already actually underway in the area, rather than introducing completely new concepts. Uh, secondly, the importance of enabling factors such as extension systems and agricultural cooperatives. Uh, and, and thirdly, um, the screening of finance to make sure that, that, uh, that finance which, which comes in is in compliance with, with southern Tanzania's vision for agricultural green growth. You also later touched on some components of the business case for a sustainable landscape, so I have to say I found that very, uh, very interesting. Um, as expounded in the report which you've recently produced, it's your opportunity to plug it again. Um, I'm looking forward to reading it. So then, Martin, um, um, you spoke about, uh, you spoke about the, the, the Moringa Fund and how your progress to date on the Moringa Fund. And really, you're, you're at the forefront of the development of a new asset class of sustainable landscape investments. So I think we all found your insights very instructive. In seeking to develop a fund which delivers a range of sustainable rural goods, uh, you described how your focus on agroforestry emerged from that, and the Moringa Fund was born. Um, and you emphasize that as well as developing a financially viable vehicle, the fund also has the objective of, of, of demonstrating what this model can achieve and providing a proof of concept to pave the way for future scaling up and expansion of such an approach. Um, and it really is worth underlining that, I think. So you, you presented Moringa as a vehicle which can deliver the, the, the triple bottom line. Then in the later discussions, you, you elaborated on the importance of, of transparency and, and making the strategy and the, ultimately the investments themselves public and open to, 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 to scrutiny. Um, and the need to, to, to demonstrate, really demonstrate the solid benefits for society as well as the, the, the financial viability, of course, of the fund. Um, so moving on then to Agnes' contribution. Um, you started with, a very, with a, what I thought was a really uh, important point, that all these big terminologies are not in the lexicon of most pastoralists, the pastoralists that you are working with, but they are, in fact, embodying many of the good practices and 
the challenges which arise from the, the paradigms that we're addressing in this session. The, the pastoralists in ICC are walking the walk, we could say, managing the land using traditional knowledge. And you, you, you underline that just because new technologies may come along, that um, the traditional practices, of course, are still valuable, perhaps, perhaps even more so. And they mustn't be lost in this era of change and the pressure to modernize. Um, you underline the need to document practices, to retain this knowledge. Um, and you also, later, um, you, you, you use the opportunity of, of, of the, the question and answer session to, to mention uh, free prior informed consent, FPIC. And I, I was nodding in agreement at this because it is, it is a fundamental principle for our work in the European Investment Bank, uh, for our investments in the agriculture and food sector. This is one of, the, one of our key uh, criteria. Um, and you concluded by underlining the importance of consultation and participation to develop effective benefit sharing in a Red Plus framework. Um, and so, coming to Pakeru, um, I cannot possibly do justice to, to uh, your, your intervention, but I'll try. Um, you... You mentioned the, the fact that landscapes, the, the landscape vision is, is, is it, it has width, but in fact, it, to, be, to be truly effective, it also needs depth. You spoke about uh, the zooming out and the zooming in, the, the need to zoom out, to, to, to um, retain or to, to uh, underline, let's say, the value of the holistic landscape's view, and um, because this is the right perspective that we need to take but of course, zooming in is also essential um, because effective action happens at a very fine grain at local level. Um, you spoke about Red Plus and underlined the need for the right regulations, strong institutions, public support of the communities, all these things have to be in place. And, and that, that in fact, finding and implementing solutions to these challenges, I don't want to say problems, challenges, is, is um, really the core of the, of, of the issue. And you also spoke to the, the overlaps or synergies between green economy, landscapes approach and Red Plus, and disagreed with the strictly sequential approach of public and private funding, and argued rather that uh, public and private funding should work hand in hand. Um, and a final point that, that you made later in the discussion, which, which was uh, a very important one, I think, was you alluded to food security and the fact that the landscape's approach in and of itself is not enough to ensure food security and you cautioned against simplistic assumptions around this extremely important issue. Um, so coming towards a conclusion, I, I, I would like to pick one question which was asked um, by um, the lady towards the back of the room. Um, I will have to get your name later, thank you. You pointed to the danger that these paradigms can describe an unattainable utopia, potentially. Again, underlining the importance of focusing on how these paradigms actually translate into tangible practices in real communities. And, from my point of view certainly, um, the, the definition of investment needs uh, that, that arise, that, that are needed to, to, to support those. So, returning to Ibrahim's challenge to this session to explain, define, demystify and coordinate the concepts of green economy, red, uh, red plus and the landscapes approach, let's always remember to translate what these paradigms mean for that farm, that village and that forest. Thank you very much. Please stay there. Uh, isn't it fantastic? Yes. Uh, even those who were not here at the beginning of the session had the full restitution and actually it's much simpler when it is presented so nicely. Um, thank you very much, uh, Jane, for that. Please give a round of applause to Jane, to Paheo, to Sarah, to Mario, to Agnes, and to Martin. <laughs>
Thank you very much uh, for this, and thank you also to Tim for having organized it. Thank you to the organizers of this fantastic yeah. event, and the report will be posted in an hour from now, thanks to Jane, <laughs> to the global organizer. Thank you very much.